All right. Well, I mentioned uh, you're in for a real treat now. We've got this innovation exchange, which is looking at, is the metaverse doomed for failure? And uh, to kick things off, we've got someone from Microsoft, so a brand representative. And then we've got three startups uh, presenting different views on this topic. So let me introduce you to Ali from Microsoft, as well as uh, representatives from Aircard, Rock Paper Reality, and Thrill. Easy. Thrill. Yeah. OK, we'll do a quick uh, introduction as you go so that the audience can know who uh, you are. So my name's Ali Rezvan, as well as being the founder for the Esports Fashion Awards, I am the retail director for Microsoft here in the UK. I spend my day job talking about the future of retail and where the market's going to be. So when you think about the metaverse, the one conversation I get asked by almost all retailers, fashion, grocery, fast fashion, is what is the metaverse? Do we invest in it? So just quickly for our audience member, we'll start off really quick. Actually, audience, how many of you know what the metaverse is? Hands up, quickly. Okay, so we're not gonna talk about, we've got a half hand. We're not gonna talk about what it is. Tell me who you are and who you work for. That's it, go. Hi, um, my name is Joseph Kaloran. I work for Rock Paper Reality. Um, our consulting part of the business uh, really works with uh, technology solution providers at the top of the chain, working with Adobe, Epic Games, Netflix, uh, Unity. So really doing your traditional corporate strategy, uh, strategic planning, uh, diligence, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So really focused in 3D and um, yeah, game engines. That deserves a woo. <laughs> Thanks. Hello, guys. Uh, my name is Marek. I work for AirCards. We create outstanding web-based immersive experiences uh, using technologies like augmented reality, virtual reality, also web, cross-platform. Uh, and yeah, I also write a column for the Drum Media Innovation Roundup. So yeah, I've been talking a lot about my metaverse, but yeah, and a surprise. If you hear seven-year-old girl talking right now, it is me. I know it's a really like a weird, weird effect, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm Alistair, uh, Creative Director and CEO of Esports Fashion Week. Um, I've been in the esports space for about seven years now. I might look 50, I'm only 24. Uh, so just keep that in mind. I've been working since about 15. So very much a consumer in the space. Um, I pride myself on knowing what teenagers and, and young adults in, in my age group want to look for, want to buy, want to watch. Um, and yeah, so creating, creating um, esports content in, in that realm. Thank you. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Tom. I head up the youth transporting department at Kids Know Best. So we're an insight-led uh, 360 agency in the kids space. So we speak up. My team speak to kids every day. Uh, as you know, all kids are gaming, watching gaming content. So I'll be able to tell you what they know about the metaverse and what their behaviors are on the metaverse. Brilliant, thank you. So for those who know Microsoft, we don't really, uh, we're not gonna be the cool kids, we wanna power the cool kids in terms of providing platforms for them. The metaverse, interestingly enough, can be seen in two ways. The future of e-commerce or the future of entertainment. From the panel, where do you see the metaverse and how your organization fits in it? If it does, you may say it's poo-poo and it doesn't fit in it. Um, well, there's a slight complication with the metaverse because it means different things depending on the, on the actor. So, you know, um, sort of meta, Microsoft, they think that, you know, VR for work and social spaces, they believe in that. Then you have the likes of Snapchat, Nike, they're looking at sort of 3D for uh, e-commerce. Then you have NVIDIA, BMW looking at industrial digital twins. You know, um, then you're looking at sort of Niantic, real time, real world augmentation, Epic Games looking at sort of social gaming. So it has different meanings depending on that actor. Um, so, and then another, you know, twist to this is that there are sort of different, you know, time to market, time to value, difficult technical inertias, um, you know, for each one of these sort of set of component technologies. So it's pretty complicated. So the truth is, we, we just, it means different things to, to different people. Thanks. Actually, you're going to go to Tom. Kids know best. Yeah, uh, uh, Nike is a great example because their main focus now is chasing Generation Alpha. And, uh, and that's the, uh, the generation I speak to the most because that's what our clients do not know where 7 to 12-year-olds are. It's almost a lost audience. But 
but what they do on in the metaverse is the, the, you know on Roblox, Minecraft, Fortnite, this real pride in their digital self. So how they express themselves digitally, uh, they take a lot of pride in that in their avatar on Roblox. You know, accessorizing their avatar um, on Minecraft, how they build things, and they like to share those creations and 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 their imagination, how they display themselves virtually with their friends online, and it's such a big part of their life now is. It's, it's a bit very much gaming is their metaverse behavior, if you like. Got you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I believe that um, metaverse is similar to mobile. Uh, basically, I started my career in mobile 10, 11 years ago, and it's like I had a lot of conversation about like people will be buying things using mobile devices, and the clients were like, <laughs> yeah, sure, or like people will be watching videos, and, and people just didn't believe that because it's like it just it was in the future. But mobile as a kind of like the ne next phase of the internet, and this is what I believe metaverse will be eventually impacted every area of la our life. Of course, it will be different for different audiences, it will be different for different clients, but also like the main thing for me about metaverse is that it has to connect kind of physical and virtual element. Like if it will be only about virtual, we should give up just now because it's like I think we need human element, we need kind of like enhancing of real experiences. So, and that will be across the board. But it will take time for us to get there. Okay, thank you. Alistair. So, look, I, I think it's a, it's a nice way to explain it. If anyone's a you know, Marvel fan, watch the latest Doctor Strange movie, we're going to end up in a situation when we're almost in a multiverse rather than a metaverse, right? I think we're going to end up with one, well, we hope we end up with one universal um, platform or system that's connected to add-ons or or, or separate you know, entities, and, and we're seeing that with video games. We're seeing Halo partner with Fall Guys and, and Call of Duty partner with different, um, completely different publishers. And so we're starting to see that sort of cross uh, integration of different products and brands uh, and more brands working together anyway in, in sort of partnerships and, and in different senses of the world. So I think uh, you know, in, in the way that we want to help the metaverse is actually to ground things in reality. Right, so as this technology is really growing and and you know really starting to push towards um, whatever it might become, because no one really knows what the metaverse could become. Right, we we know you know it's digital items, it's some sort of digital life, but we still don't know what to expect from it. For us, it's super important to take the products that we have through our partners in Esports Fashion Week for the fact that they're all very small brands and everything is currently digital. You can't touch and feel the garments. You don't know what you're buying. You don't know exactly how the sizing works. So for us, it's super important to still ground purchasing in reality and still contain some sort of physical interaction when it comes to shopping or products. So I think you know, the metaverse is great and you know, having more access to our digital lives is going to be fantastic. But I do think that having some sort of physical presence is not only important for like, mental health for everyone moving forward, uh, but just in general for both commerce and e-commerce. OK, one for the audience. Avatars and identity are big, two big areas in the metaverse. How many people in the audience have actually created an avatar online? Hands up. Not that many. OK. <laughs> Second question, two parts. Do you believe Gartner's research showed that we will be spending 25% or 22% of society will be spending two hours or more a day in the metaverse? And this was 2022 Gartner research. How many of you believe that? Hands up if you feel we're going to be spending 25% of our day in the metaverse. How do they define that, though? They, through their research in terms of propensity to be online and propensity on Oculus data and whatever VR headsets they've got. So hands up again. Yes. Two hours or more. Yeah. Correct. Okay, passionate two hours or more. Panel, what do you think? Will we be spending two hours or more in a virtual world? I believe in some ways, some people already do it, depending on the definition of me metaverse. But actually, you mentioned Gartner. I think their piece about what is metaverse is one of the best kind of summary of what metaverse is, is a combinatorial in, uh, innovation, basically connecting virtual reality, augmented reality, gaming, whatever there is. And people are already engaging with these things. If you're looking at the numbers from Snapchat, if you're looking for the numbers from 8 if you're looking for the numbers from uh, Fortnite, 
people are already there. Like I was doing a session about metaverse and I was giving these numbers about, oh, people, certain percentage of people spending this much time. But in a way, people just, people that are in metaversal type of experiences, they don't care whether it's called metaverse, what it is, it's just like they, they engaging in immersive experiences already. And some of them, and I think it's like, kind of kids and younger generation do it much more than two hours. Yeah. Uh, and there's millions and millions of them, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, that's the thing. You, you could argue that kids are on the metaverse most now because Roblox, because of lockdown, Minecraft, Fortnite, it's a social communication tool. So they're on Roblox to chat with friends. So 11-year-olds will start at Roblox, FaceTime, They'll trade pets on Adopt Me. Very much a, 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 a collective experience. So you could argue that kids are on the metaverse more than anyone right now, exchanging digital products. I, I think it hit me. I was 15 playing Call of Duty, and I spent 200 pounds on just physical things for the game, skins, characters, etc. And that was in 2013. So to say that you know, we're going to spend two hours in, in some sort of metaverse is actually an understatement. I agree more with the 24 hours. Um, on the basis that actually anything we're doing in terms of communicating online, everything's been that sort of lead up to get us ready to communicate in the metaverse. Look at Tinder, look at Hinge, right? 15 years ago, you talk about online dating, you're probably talking about plenty of fish and a bunch of catfishes. Now you're talking about genuine romances and marriages coming from the internet. I wouldn't so, know. Yeah, well, to, to <laughs> genuinely, to think that, you know, we're moving in a way where there's, there's a thing called VR chat, right? It's basically a completely open world. You chuck on a VR headset and you can meet complete strangers from around the world. And people are meeting potential partners and, and you know, marriages are happening because of games like this and worlds like this. So I think children and, and you know, Gen Z and, and even people my age are spending definitely more than two hours a day in some sort of metaverse. Again, we still don't know exactly what that is. We just have to class it as sort of that digital lifestyle or communication. But you have digital friends that they've never met in real life as well. Big yeah. thing now as well. I met one of my best friends literally last year who I'd known for 10 years. He lives in Canada. I lived here. That was, we met through Twitch, through video games. I got you. Um, we, we, you know, we don't know. I think that there will always be an audience that will want to spend more time in a VR you know, for social or for work maybe two plus, you know, two, four hours. Um, I think what we, if we look at it from a core fundamental common denominator, what we are seeing are, are a host of new um, engagement platforms that are 3D native. They will need content. That content needs to come from somebody. It will need to come from a pro-consumer, user-generated, or from a brand. So we've got this sort of, you know, vicious cycle that, you know, those engagement platforms need to be fed with content. And as we feed it content, which, you know, is a hurdle because we have to see, you know, that 3D, you know, content needs to be optimized for those platforms. Um, yeah, th that engagement could, could rise and, and could be, you know, um, hours at a time, depending on the use case. Okay. Innovation and experimentation, traditionally, retailers have been really bad at doing it in effective ways. What I'm interested in, again, the show from the hands, from the audience, how many people have done any experimentation or innovation in the metaverse? Hands up. Two hands, three hands. Okay. I'm curious from the panel's perspective, if I was gonna build a path or a, or a series of innovations or whatever, what does that look like? How do I even go into the Tinderverse? <laughs> Which, uh, I, I, look, the, the closest I've been to some sort of creativity. You don't have to answer the Tinderverse. Oh, no, 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 don't worry. Uh, creativity in sort of the metaverse was, I mean, I rebuilt my entire house on Minecraft because I was bored. How long ago was that? Sorry. I, I don't know, five years ago. I was still pretty old. Um, but look, I think looking at how we can be creative and use the tools now we have in the metaverse. I think it's actually looking at technologies like AR and, and VR and MR. So looking at the, uh, the Microsoft uh, HoloLens, right? That, that's, that allows for some sort of digital interaction in a physical world. And I think that's what's going to benefit us now. Google Glass, if you remember that, came out decades ago. Yep. Yep. And, uh, and people to this day still use that in sort of the manufacturing and industrial fields to allow them to know where things are stored in a warehouse or directions in a, in, in a big building. So, I think we've got to look at 
how we can utilize the tools that we are developing, not only as just video games or fun entertainment platforms, but how we can allow tools that you know, would either be extremely expensive in real life or tools that are just unattainable for some people because Adobe decided to charge you know, 200 pounds for students a year to use their software. So how can we use the metaverse and how can we build our own tools within these platforms in order to step into that world and still carry over a lot of the creativity that we have as individuals, but in that digital realm? Sure. Do you have a view on the pathway to experimentation and innovation in the space? Yeah, so kind of our stance is um, it's very hard to have a strategy uh, long term because it's a disruptive market so that these technologies are emerging. So going back to the, if you look at these at different sets of component technologies, you know, what, what Meta does or Microsoft does or even Niantic does can have a, a big impact, in the impact on that technologies and how it disrupts that market dynamic. So looking from a brand perspective, you should be looking at short-term commercial opportunities and a long-term is mitigating that risk of an emerging market. Got you. Uh, I think with sort of avatars with children on Roblox, if you're a clothing brand or a shoemaker or you do accessories, then you can have branded uh, accessories items on Roblox available to purchase. And it, uh, it's merging that uh, physical and digital ownership of an item. Uh, Nike do it well with uh, Air Force One releases. They have a, a specific place on Roblox where you can interact with that new product. But also there's the physical release as well. I think brands need to try and merge the two a bit better. You know, if you have the latest Converse shoe, you almost automatically get a digital version of it. I think that's a, a strategy that needs to be implemented by brands. Okay, so we have a slight path to Web3 NFTs there. Anyone in the audience own an NFT? Again, minority, probably loss of value, right? Anyway, audience, any Web3.0 thoughts? I think like NFTs are for me quite interesting because it's like I believe that they're a part of the answer, not necessarily an answer. I think there is a lot of hype around them and we see especially in the branded space that a lot of brands just doing them, I feel a little bit for the sake of doing the NFT project. And they do not ask even the questions like what is the value for the customer? What is a kind of like what is the long term view on this technology or what can it deliver to brands? And even like just really quickly just coming to your like question before, I think it's like when you think about these new things you and you even bringing to brands like trying to get them innovate, you have to be really, really honest, I think, especially in this new place about the limitations of them. Just be, because it's like then you, by over promising, you get to the place when people are, it's like, oh, I've done this, doesn't work, I will never do it again. Yeah. And I think it's like this happens with the metaverse or uh, activation with NFTs. So it's like, it is just asking questions like, how does it work for my company outside of the PR note that I will put out somewhere? It's just kind of so. Um, I think definitely the digital ownership for a lot of things that the guys already mentioned will be such a massive part of what is coming. But I just I think right now NFTs are a bit out of control, in my opinion, from a brand perspective or marketing tool. Sure. Any other views on NFTs or Web3? For me, it's just a dangerous place for kids because they want to be current and in the know, participating. But it just feels like a hype train Ponzi scheme where kids can get exploited by it because creators, YouTubers, gaming So how do we YouTube protect them? Because that's a really Good question. strong and important point. <laughs> yeah. Because I've heard of 12-year-olds creating NFTs and making money. Yeah. But th at the same time, they might want to purchase an NFT, you know, low level. But it can be a mass selling NFT from a creator that they might trust without, you know, they don't fact check a high profile individual. They see a, a, a well-followed creator and almost trust that voice based on followers. Yeah. So it's just it's, it's a very dangerous place for an, an exploitative place for the youth of today for me. Okay. Uh, I, th I think what really you know what, what you were saying in terms of influencers and you know the exploits of NFTs to call 10,000 randomly generated apes art is kind of an insult on on a lot of artists that I look up to. Um, you know, I don't think Pablo Picasso died and, you know, we randomly generated 10,000 pieces of artwork that looked like his and they sold for millions of dollars. So to think that NFTs as art in terms of 10,000 randomly generated apes can sort of withhold any sort of value 
I think is pretty rid uh, ridiculous. Um, I would recommend, uh, there's a YouTuber called CoffeeZilla. Um, he's absolutely fantastic. Uh, he'll break down every single Ponzi scheme that's happening or happened with NFTs and Bitcoin and different cryptocurrencies. Uh, and there is a lot of rug pulls and pump and dumps uh, because it's not a regulated market. Sure. NFTs in the form of access are fantastic. So for example, I went to Coachella this year, and with everyone who attended, they gave them an NFT. And that NFT just reminded them of an event they went to. It was you know, a specific design. So it's cool, right? You went to that event. You have a piece of memorabilia that you didn't pay for. It's nothing that you're really looking to sell, right? It, it's something that you keep as a memory. Now, Taco Bell did something similar. They released five, um, gold, or five black cards as NFTs. Now, you can keep that and have unlimited tacos for life or you can sell it in 10 years time when it's worth $100,000 and then 10 years after when it's worth a million. So having an NFT for access is absolutely fantastic. Using NFTs for art in the way that they are being exploited now is ridiculous. Sounds like Gary Vaynerchuk, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're in our final minute. Audience, after listening to our expert panel, do you believe the um, uh, metaverse is fad or is here to stay? So hands up for those who feel it's a fad. <laughs> those who believe it's here to stay. And with that, thank you so much for allowing us to talk to you about the metaverse.